Steve, the common view in Australia today, and certainly promoted by a lot of activists, is that we're a secular country, and we always have been. We've never, you paint a picture of um, Christian faith having played quite a role. Uh, and uh, I think history verifies that. But by way of illustration, towards the end of my days as an MP, I was asked to a public meeting in a fairly significant town in my electorate where there was a great dispute going on. The community wanted to access Commonwealth support for a school chaplain, and the school principal was absolutely opposed. It was plain, the, plainly the case that he was quite hostile to the idea. And he argued that public education was secular, and he went right back to its foundation uh, when the state took over the church's uh, role of, in education. Uh, I don't think he knew his history, and I don't think we understand what secular means anyway, anymore. It's another one of those words that we've significantly, uh, if you like, um, changed the meaning of. Yeah, well, I mean, that, uh, that's the, the subject of this book that, um, that I, I had the honor of co-writing with a couple of, of colleagues, um, Ian Tregenza and John Gascoigne, and, and writing with Ian and John is just one of the great honors of my life. Uh, brilliant scholars, fantastic guys. But uh, I, um, the, the, the question that we wanted to answer uh, with this book uh, was what did people throughout Australian history mean when they said that we have a secular state and that we have a secular education system. Uh, so for example, Edmund Barton in the 1890s uh, uh, Federation Convention debates, in fact in 1897. Said, future Prime Minister. Yes, the future Prime Minister, the yeah. first Prime Minister, mm -hmm. exactly. He said that the whole business of politics is secular. Um, as you pointed out, the Education Acts uh, of the later, the, the later part of the 19th century uh, are known as the Free Compulsory and Secular Education Acts. And, and, um, and they said that from here in, uh, public education would be secular education. And I and my colleagues wanted to know, well, what exactly did that mean? And so I went around to archives all around Australia, and my colleagues actually went to archives in England uh, just to find out what Australians meant by secular and how Australians understood the relationship between church and state. And this book uh, is the product of that. And what I was quite amazed to find is that for the most part in the 19th century, when those acts were established, and even well into the 20th century, the word secular meant Christian. What? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I had a suspicion that the word secular would not quite mean what people think it means today. That is a complete absence of religion. But I was amazed at what I found in the archives. So if I can just give you one example, because this sort of sheds light on what the colonials who wrote the Secular Education Acts meant when they said from here in we want education to be secular. And so I, I was at the uh, State Library of Victoria archives and I discovered an 1867 report uh, by a government committee chaired by George Higginbottom, uh, who wound up being a very influential Victorian. And it was on the state of education in Victoria. And the idea was that they, yeah. To that point being provided, I take it, by the churches. Uh, up until that point, Education throughout the colonies was provided by both the churches and there were some public schools as well. It was called the dual system. Right. So when edu so the, the first schools in the colonies were actually church schools. It was the churches and missionaries who spearheaded education in the colonies, certainly in New South Wales and, and, yeah, and definitely in the other colonies as well. From about, mainly from the 1850s to the 1870s, um, and 80s in, in New South Wales, I believe, the education system became what was called the dual system, which meant that the, the, the colonial governments funded both the denominational schools and the public schools. Then as each state, uh, each colony started its own uh, free compulsory and secular education act, at that point, colonial governments severed the funding to the church schools, and those church schools very often became public schools, but with the understanding that religion would be taught in the schools. 
And so from sort of the 1870s, again, it depends on the state. Some were a bit earlier, some were a bit later. But say from the 1870s, uh, education in Australia, uh, public education was the only education that was funded by the colonial governments. All denominational schools, including public schools, were solely privately funded by the parents. And that basically continued up to around about 1964. So for around about 90 years in Australia, uh, there was just uh, there was just state funding of public schools. And the system that we have now, which is uh, that the government funds both private and public schools, that is actually uh, what we had prior to the, the state-only system. We've, gone, we've kind of gone back to the dual system. But on the question, what did the legislators mean by secular? And so what we did was we went through the archives to find uses of the word secular. We found thousands of them. Uh, in books, in leaflets, in parliamentary debates, in all sorts of things. And this particular report written in 1867, it was a, a, a Victorian committee wanting to look into education, sent a bunch of people out into Victoria to knock on doors and ask people all sorts of questions. And one of the questions that was asked was, um, how do you understand the word secular? It's amazing, that's a question that they asked. And this is the answer given in 1867. Now, this is Victoria. Uh, by by the, the people who were asked? By, or by parents. By right. By okay. parents, that's right. right. And so a fellow here is, 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 has returned to the board and said, this is what the parents told me. And this is all recorded in the report. The report was hundreds and hundreds of pages. And he says, this is a quote, if they are spoken to about secular instruction, they will tell you they are in favour of it. So Victorian parents were in favor of secular instruction. The quote continues, but they mean by that, uh, but they mean by that, that they are always to have a chapter of the Bible read every morning. I find that is their understanding of the term secular instruction. So this is quite amazing that for many Victorians, what they meant by secular instruction was that the Bible is read in schools. Um, now, that doesn't make sense to us in, uh, in, no, in, no, it in the modern world. It doesn't. How could they possibly have meant that? Well, here's the thing. Um, by secular in the 19th century, what colonials, uh, elites, and just common people tended to mean was, relig was the inclusion, was, a, was basically an education system that included religion, but no particular religious teachings that discriminated against any kind of Christian denomination. So by secular education, what they meant was uh, education that included some basic general Christianity. Now, the question a lot of people right now are asking is, why did they think secular education had to include any religion at all in the first place? Well, for the same reason that nowadays in our secular schools, children are taught about fairness, they're taught about human rights, they're taught about toleration. Because the idea of the secular historically is the idea, or well, the word secular means this world, this age. And so a secular state is a state that seeks to secure our well-being and happiness in this life. It's interested in our property rights, it's interested in our freedoms, it's not interested so much in whether our souls are saved. That's for the church. This, now, secular education was, again, the idea of educating children so that they enjoy happiness in this life. That's what the idea of secular education meant. But let's go back to our John Adams quote in the late 18th century. John Adams said that for people to be moral, they need to be religious. Now, that was a common idea, not just in the 18th century, but also in the 19th century and well into the 20th century. Which, and now the question is, is the society going to be happier if people are moral or immoral? Well, the answer is that a society is going to be happier if the people are moral. And so a secular education will be an education that seeks to make children moral. But in the 19th century mind, morality is basically the same as Christianity. Like when you teach children to be moral, you're basically going to teach them of Ten Commandments. You're going to teach them about gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And so secular education in the 19th century believed that you must teach morality. But because people in the 19th century believed that Christianity was the foundation of morality, they believed that a secular education system must teach Christianity.
And that was the logic that people understood at the time. And so when the Secular Education Acts took place, so uh, in Victoria in 1872, New South Wales in 1880 and other states in other years, we make a huge mistake if we think that those acts meant that religion was meant to be taken out of the schools. In fact, they did not mean that religion was meant to be taken out of the schools at all. What they meant was that education should include, or at least may include religion, but of a non-sectarian, non-denominational kind. And that's why when people say, said in this quote, I want secular education, which to them meant reading the Bible, in their mind, they're saying, well, all Christians believe the Bible. And so whether you're Protestant or whether you're Catholic, reading the Bible is a given. And so that will suffice for the moral teaching in a secular school. And to give you an idea of how unsecular the secular schools were, this is another quote from Victoria in 1898. Now, Victorian education was meant to be secularized in 1872, in the 1872 Education Act. Uh, there was an atheist uh, around that time named Joseph Symes, who was a very famous atheist in the 19th century, he had his own atheist newspaper. This is what he wrote in the newspaper in 1898. And let me tell you, John, this was one of those eureka moments. This was one of those moments that historians live for. I went through about 10,000 pages of this newspaper that he wrote. You're and, a braver man than me. And I found this quote. He, 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 this is what he writes in his newspaper. I bought the primer published this year by the Victorian government, and I thought and think it may be useful for teaching my little girl. But I protest against the rubbish furnished at the end of the book. On page 62, the child is taught utterly incomprehensible nonsense about giving its soul to the Lord. I should like the opportunity of publicly cross-questioning the humbugs who selected and printed that stuff. That was from 1898 from a Victorian school textbook. When we say that the colonial architects of the Education Acts meant for religion to be taken out of the schools, we profoundly misunderstand what they meant by secular. And so any argument that says that religion should be taken out of schools because the Education Acts are secular is really based on a horrible misreading of history. That's Extraordinary. If what you say is true, of course, it's very profound because it means that right at the heart of something as important as education is at least a misunderstanding, at worst, a rewriting of history to serve modern purposes and the modern narrative, not to elucidate information and understanding. Well, absolutely. And this is because the word secular uh, has itself, in a sense, been secularized, particularly over the last 60 years. I mean, even up until 1960, in the Ramsey Report on Education in Victoria, one of the stated purposes of education in Victoria was to teach children about the Christian heritage of their country and to teach them Christian morality. Now, that's 1960 in Victoria. Uh, so the words, and, and that was considered a secular system. And so the word secular has most certainly changed uh, since then. And one of the, 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 the projects of this book was to try to understand why the word secular has changed. And essentially the word secular has changed his meaning from meaning uh, a way of thinking and an education system and even a government that is very hospitable to Christianity to an education system that to a large extent seeks to exclude Christianity and even to a political, uh, a, a political system that doesn't allow uh, religion to have any influence in the laws. That tends to be what we mean by secular today. Now in the 19th century, the idea that, that religious morality wouldn't have any influence in politics or the laws, that was a ridiculous idea because that was essentially the same as saying that there'd be no morality in politics. So what has changed is essentially our, our view of Christianity. Because our view of Christianity has changed over the last 60 years, our understanding of the extent to which a secular order can accommodate Christianity has radically changed. But since the 1950s and especially since the 1960s, social morality has changed. And I dare say, John, you've lived through these changes. Uh, you you know, lived through the later 60s, you lived through the 1970s, where you saw 
um, popular attitudes to things like the family, uh, gender, sexuality, um, changed quite radically, particularly in the 1960s. And so, especially probably after the availability of, of uh, very of highly effective and easily accessible contraception in the early 1960s, all around the Western world for the most part, our, under, our, 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 our sexual practices have greatly changed. And so, with the introduction of, 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 of contraception, of, of, of very effective contraception. I mean, contraception has been around since the ancient world. John Stuart Mill was thrown in prison for handing out tracts on contraception when he was 17 years old, and that was in the early 19th century. Contraception has been around for a long time. What changes in the 1960s is that contraception becomes incredibly effective. Um, and what that means is suddenly the question of why do I need to save sex for marriage actually becomes a, 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 a question worth asking because prior to effective contraception, keeping sex within marriage was not just a sort of a religious idea. It was just common sense because everyone knew that if you go around having sex, you're probably at some point either going, you're probably at some point going to make a baby and you need to be able to support that baby. And historically, we have an institution that is designed to support children and that is marriage. Marriage was understood as a natural institution grounded in the fact that we are sexual beings and, the, and the, out, the biological outworking of that fact is that we create other human beings. And that was sort of the main point of marriage, to manage that. But when you separate sexual activity from its, its, its pro-life um, inevitabilities, then the question then arises, well, why keep the old sexual morality? Why can't we have multiple sexual partners? Why do we have to wait until marriage to have sex? And so, especially with the availability of contraception, sexual mores start to change. And when that starts to change, um, other ideas about sexuality start to change as well. So if we're going to get rid of monogamy and the idea of sex only before marriage, well, what about other taboos? So what about, for example, homosexuality? Perhaps that's something that we're a bit behind the times on now as well. And so the sexual revolution of the 1960s uh, changes the way we think about sexuality, sexual ethics. And what it does is that it brings popular understandings of sexuality and sexu sexual ethics on a path away from traditional Christianity to the point where if people nowadays say that you should save sex to marriage for marriage or the only uh, the only valid form of sexual expression is within heterosexual marriage you are now not even any longer seen as sort of overly moralistic you're actually seen as quite immoral that the, the public morality has so shifted away from traditional christianity on those issues that traditional christianity is actually seen as detrimental to people's mental health and actually detrimental to a, a healthy lifestyle. And what that means is that if the idea of secular education and the idea of a secular state is all about securing people's happiness and well-being in this life, then Christianity, because it is no longer considered particularly moral, at least in its teachings now on gender, say transgenderism is another issue, and sexuality, then Christianity cannot have any influence in the secular sphere. Certainly it shouldn't have any influence in education and it shouldn't have any influence in politics. And so the word secular has gone from meaning very capacious and open to the influence of Christianity to meaning a sphere in which Christianity uh, is, either held, is either just barely tolerated or deemed to be uh, a threat because our understanding of Christianity has so shifted because our understanding of morality has shifted and our understanding of what it is to be living a healthy life has shifted. And that's kind of where we are today. You know, <clears throat> it does strike me that Christianity is blamed for a very great deal in our culture and still is. There seems to be an idea in a lot of circles that it's still this terrible leftover of Christianity that's crippling our happiness and what have you. I remember the slogan uh, that was all over London buses back when Dawkins first became prominent that read, um, 
uh, don't worry about God, he's probably not there, so go and have a good time. Yeah. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> well, we've actually behaved as though he's not there now for decades, Yeah. but we're not having a good time. And I would simply cite the raw data on that. We seem to be more anxious, more depressed, there's more self-harm, we're more tribalised, we're more divided, we're less trustful mm. to the point where our culture is falling apart. I think these are very, very challenging issues, I have to say. Well, the irony of all of this, John, is that maybe, um, maybe these problems have never been worse, at least in recorded memory. But at the same time, here's the irony, John, that Christianity has never been socially weaker. And yet at the same time, it's never been more socially held accountable for the things that are going on today. Uh, a great example of, of all of this um, is the Izzy Falau issue in, in Australia. And, and it perfectly sh shows the point. Um, now, all around sort of sort of the, the modern liberal democratic world, certainly in, in, um, in the UK, in America, in Australia, in Canada, in Scandinavia, uh, Christianity, so I'll say traditional biblical Christianity with its understanding of human sexuality and its understanding of human gender as basically being binary, male or female, with some exceptions to you know, people born with you know, medical disorders, you know. Um, Christianity is being treated in, 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 in all of those countries increasingly as something quite pernicious because our, our views on sexuality and gender have so radically changed over the last 30 years. And so in Australia, as you know, John, and, and um, but some overseas may not know, we have, we have a footballer, Israel Folau, who posted on Twitter a tweet uh, basically saying that a whole bunch of uh, sinful activities would send someone to hell without repenting uh, and turning to Jesus for salvation. And one of the sins uh, was homosexuality or homosexual activity, probably better put. And um, now the, the, here, here's something that perfectly demonstrates my point about the status of Christianity now and how far we've come. That the criticism, now Israel Folau lost his job over that as a footballer. Now, the criticism against Israel Folau was not that his words against homosexuality were offensive. That was not the great criticism. The criticism of Israel Folau was that his words on homosexuality were harmful, that they were actually causing people to uh, commit suicide. And this is where Christianity is sort of at right now in some respects in modern culture. Um, critics of Christianity in the Enlightenment period, their main critique of Christianity was that it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. It believes in virgins giving birth and other things that just don't have the ring of empirical scientific truth. Okay. That's not really the critique of Christianity anymore for the most part. The critique of Christianity now, and it's the critique that Christians and churches are going to have to really think about and, and, and try to answer, is that Christianity is detrimental to people's mental health, that Christianity is actually harmful. And this is part of a, of a new ideology, a new way of thinking about the government that's strongly emerged over the last 40 years uh, that some people would call the therapeutic state, that it's not just enough for governments to secure our freedom and our property rights, it also ought to be securing our mental and emotional well-being. And it's actually quite dangerous because as soon as you can offer an argument that certain words, certain beliefs, certain practices might make other people feel bad about themselves, which might lead them to situations of self-harm or even suicide, at that point, you can use medical science, or at least you know, medical science to justify silencing freedom of speech and silencing and, and stopping religious freedom. And that's where we are right now in this therapeutic state where essentially where we're heading is medical technocrats determining the things that people can say and cannot say and the practices that people can pursue based on their alleged mental health effects. Uh, and nothing shows that our attitudes towards Christianity have changed more than that Israel Folau case. But this is actually 
pretty dangerous in my opinion uh, because everything about it smacks of future limits on what we can say and on what we can do. And it'll all be in the name of healthcare. And that's something that's really hard to argue about, uh, argue against. You touch on the idea of ideologies. Uh, it's quite a strong feeling in Australia that ideology is dangerous. Yeah. We're a pragmatic people. We should just get on with life. In reality, like great and powerful ideas everywhere, ideology has had and will continue to have a massive influence on how we live. So, for example, I mean, I share your concern that we will shortly face the very real prospect that ideas that are deemed to be harmful to people's well-being, mental well-being or otherwise, will be outlawed and that that will result in the shutting down of some very important debates. Yes. Um, but on the other hand, if we stand back, the idea that you can do away with ideologies is to say that nobody can debate from a logical perspective. You slip into opportunism uh, and into managerialism uh, and if even populism. Where do you see the great debates? Amongst, you know, once it was socialism, it was communism, it was free enterprise, it was capitalism. Um, now it seems to be about the upturned stool of liberalism and all of these issues of racism, of transgenderism and so on and so forth, which as Douglas Murray points out, very hard to build a stable society on them, a working and functional and cooperative society. But where do you see the great debates going now about what we believe as we hopefully start to come out of COVID? I think what I think in terms of there are a few things going on in just in terms of the state of debate around the West. I think there are, there are technological reasons for why uh, debate has taken such a downturn and, and become so vitriolic. I think in the old days there were serious gatekeepers to the media and only ideas of a certain quality and a certain thoughtfulness, even if they were of a particular ideology, were sort of allowed sort of air to breathe. Uh, whereas with um, social, whereas with uh, yeah, social media, anyone can have a blog, anyone can tweet, anyone can make a Facebook post. And what that means is anyone can whip up a kind of virtual mob to demonize another person and try to destroy their career, uh, namely what we call cancel culture. So in try to understand, trying to understand the, the state of current debate, it's not all ideology, although I'll get to the ideology in a second. Some of it is just technology, which has allowed every Tom, Dick and Harry to have an opinion. Whereas 20 years ago, if they'd sent their letter into the newspaper or sent their article in, uh, it would have been thrown straight in the bin. Uh, there are good things about that because what it mean, also means is that we can hold the media to account. And that's actually a really, really good thing. But the downside is that debates can easily slip into abuse. Uh, you still have debates today. You still have rational debates. But the problem is that they're crowded out and shouted down by the less rational activity that often takes place at the level of social media. And that's, that's the problem. The problem today is not that we don't have rational debates taking place. The problem is that too often we can't hear them over the yelling and the, what I would call the cacophony of so much social media, which again has made cancel culture possible. Yeah, because I would add to that over the cacophony, but it's more than that, the intimidation absolutely. and the bullying. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, nowadays, of course, it's becoming increasingly common for people to self-censor because, again, once upon a time, if you'd have said something and someone took issue with it, there are only a handful of people that they could have told and it wouldn't have really gone anywhere. But nowadays, if you say something, there are people on social media who literally have access to thousands upon thousands of people who can all get together and again, form what I called earlier, a virtual mob and then attack your place of work or wherever and basically try to destroy your livelihood, cancel culture. So there's a technological aspect to the state of modern debate. But there is also, there, I, I do believe that there is a kind of 
ideological aspect. And I think part of it may be that as a culture, again, with the, maybe with the decline of Christianity, we've lost a common consensus on what it is to be a human being, what human beings are meant to be doing on earth, a common consensus of just basic principles of morality, which used to be, um, which, which everyone used to generally adhere to. And now we're at a point where we've almost got morally and normatively just nothing in common anymore. And what I mean by that is, in Australia, we had raging debates on socialism and capitalism in the 19th century, in the, 20, in the first half of the 20th century. People disagreed deeply on those things. But whether you were liberal or labor, you still agreed on deeper issues about you know, what it is to be a human being, um, issues of, of morality. You know, people agreed on that kind of thing. And it was on the issues such as what is the right economic system that we ought to have. That's what we disagreed on. But now we're in an age where not only will people disagree on what the right economic system ought to be, whether it ought to be socialism or capitalism or some other ism, but they will disagree all the way down to the ground on what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a male, what it is to be a female, uh, what a family is. Things that, again, in the old days, people did not disagree on, things that we all held in common. And so when you combine the sort of lack of consensus on very deep questions of human identity, human morality, and I would even say human destiny, when you combine that with the current ability for social media to amplify the most irrational, unreasonable, vitriolic voices, then you wind up uh, in a society that quite in many ways um, what we're seeing is, is frankly tearing itself apart. Uh, and that is, in a sense, where we're at uh, today. And so where are, what are the future ideologies? Well, I think in some ways we're always going to have the debates over uh, what the proper economic system ought to be, whether it ought to be capitalism, whether it ought to be socialism, whether there ought to be a sort of golden mean in between, something like social democracy. Those debates are still going. But we're now seeing new kinds of ideologies arising. And like I said, they've been arising over the last 40 years. And one of them I mentioned earlier, sort of therapeuticism, uh, the idea that the good life is a life of mental well-being. And therefore, anyone who does not experience mental well-being is being denied a right. And if you can say that someone else is making you feel bad about yourself, then you have identified the person who is violating your rights. And what is the state other than an institution that stops people's rights from being violated? So you invoke the state to silence that person or stop them doing what they're doing. So that's the, that's the therapeutic uh, ideology that's really coming through. The other ideology that's become very prominent, and you've spoken about this, this with other guests, is what is nowadays sort of called wokeness or what is now being called a kind of great awakening. Uh, and, and that is essentially the idea as we discussed earlier, that basically all prevailing institutions in Western society, all prevailing practices and all ideologies and ideas are absolutely irredeemably tainted or vitiated by the new sins of racism, homophobia and patriarchy. And this is a radical, a radical ideology in that it seeks to, to overturn all existing institutions and kind of start again from year zero. In this respect, wokeism is uh, an heir of the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, not revolutions like the British Revolution of 1688 or the American Revolution of, six, of 1776, both of which sought to re-establish practices that they thought had recently been violated. They were, in a sense, revolutions to re-establish traditions. Uh, the French Revolution of 1789 and the Russian Revolution of 1970, 1917 were revolutions to sweep everything away and start again. And certainly wokeism and the riots and protests that we're seeing in America right now, uh, spearheaded by Black Lives Matter and also Antifa, uh, 
they are very much a legacy of the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Their view is that everything is so horribly tainted and vitiated by the sins, and I deliberately use the word sin, of racism and patriarchy and homophobia and all the other sins that they need to be swept away entirely. Uh, there is nothing redeeming in it. And that is another ideology that we're having to deal with. You optimistic or pessimistic about the future? There are two famous statements about history. There's one by uh, George Santayana, and it's a famous one, and he says, you know, those that do not know history are doomed to repeat it. And then there's George Hegel, and Hegel said, history teaches man that history teaches man nothing. I find myself torn between those two. The problem that I have with George Santayana is that there's an implication that if you understand history, therefore you'll be able to shape the future. The problem with that is, is that I'm not so sure that we're in control of the forces that, within which we live that shape our lives and shape our, our destinies. The things that shape history are things like economics, warfare, disease, uh, ideas. Some of them we have some control over. A lot of it we don't have a lot of control over. And so the idea that if you understand what happened in the past, therefore you can shape the future, really to me overestimates the extent to which we're in control of the processes of history. But then Hegel says it, it teaches us nothing. I don't think that's true either. I think we do actually learn from history. At the very least, uh, we can learn what is very likely to happen to us and history gives us an opportunity to brace ourselves for it for when it hits whether it's a light at the end of a tunnel or a train as the saying goes look uh, i'm a christian uh, i believe that jesus christ is the lord of history i believe that christ created the universe and i believe in providence i believe that history is ultimately guided by the hand of god and it will be guided to an end um, and so in that sense, I guess I'm something of an optimistic, but I would call myself a pessimistic optimist in that I believe that in our lives as individuals, and I think it's probably replicated in our societies, uh, we tend to learn from our mistakes and that for things to get better, they often first have to get worse for us to realize what exactly we have done. And so for me, even if it turns out that we find ourselves uh, going on the path that I think we're going on, and we find ourselves in a society or a civilization um, that no longer has any value for human life, that barely is able to distinguish, to distinguish between good and evil, a civilization that has in many ways lost faith in itself, a civilization that is under attack from within, and from without by greater powers, that even if we find ourselves in that situation in the future, to my mind, we found ourselves in the same situation that the earliest followers of Jesus found themselves in. And the rest is history. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. You've taken us deep. I know there's an appetite uh, on the part of many people to really think through what life uh, means, does it have purpose, does it have meaning, and how did we get to the messy situation that we're in today. So thank you for taking us there, and I wish you well. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there, and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.